This Impact Wrestling Review was brought to you by 5-Hour Energy. Try it, and the TNA writers will give Bobby Roode his personality back. It seems like the TNA writers have two main go-to angles these days. Two basic concepts that they just like to use ad nauseum and think they never get old. Number one contendership matches and tournaments. The results of which feel like they're becoming increasingly pointless as they continue to tread water creatively until a new TV deal kicks in. More and more lately, it's one or the other with this stuff. Part of me thinks that if you took these two concepts off the table, they wouldn't know what the hell to do right now. Probably because that would require them putting more thought into booking impact than is absolutely 100% necessary, which, as I've stated a number of times recently, I'm not convinced that they're doing. This week it was a tag tournament. Eight teams to find new challengers for the Wolves. And there weren't too many options available, so mostly we saw a bunch of makeshift teams, some of which were more interesting than others. Credit where it's due, they tried to work some kind of storyline into most of these matches, wasn't that interesting in every case, but they did try. The Hardys beat the Bromance. Thank you. That's all I really care to say about that one. The rest of the matches were a little more interesting. We had Gunner and Samuel Shaw versus the most compelling makeshift team in this thing, Loki and Samoa Joe. And there was a story here. Unfortunately, it wasn't very good. Brittany asks Shaw to do the thing they talked about. Then Shaw says Gunner's like a brother to him, and Gunner's like, let's go show them what great friends we are. And if you didn't know what was going to happen at that point, this was probably the first wrestling show you've ever watched in your life. They telegraphed the hell out of that one. You could see that heel turn coming from the fucking moon. Surprise, motherfucker. Not really. I think the only ones surprised by this were Tanae and Taz. But that confusion aside, there was a positive in this. After months and months of this angle going abso fucking lootly nowhere, something finally happened. Shaw turns on Gunner and hooks up with Brittany. Okay, now we've got something to work with. But unless this leads to Shaw and Brittany actually starting to win matches, which at this point I'm skeptical about, then that won't mean a whole lot. Then we had Anderson and Melendez versus MVP and Kenny King, and this one also had a story, it's just a story I don't like. I'm still not sure why Kenny King and MVP are being dicks to Chris Melendez. I was never clear on what their reason was, or if they even had one to begin with beyond just being evil for evil's sake. But the right team won in my opinion, and Kenny got his win back on Melendez, so I'm not going to crap on this one too much. Finally, we had EC3 and Tyrus versus Eric Young and Rockstar Spud. Rockstar Spud is it! This was simultaneously the most interesting match of the tournament because of the story with EC3 and Spud, and the most boring match of the tournament because Tyrus was in it. I didn't think his wrestling could be more boring than it was in WWE, but by God, he managed it. This alleged superstar is an unworthy opponent. However, it's a testament to the story and how good EC3 and Spud have been that the match still had me engaged despite that. They've really done a good job getting Spud over as a sympathetic underdog babyface. EC3 is burying him, the crowd gets behind him, he tries his hardest and he gets in his hope spots, but he's a little guy facing two really big guys and he just comes up short. But he got the crowd into him. They wanted Spud to stand up for himself and get over on these guys. And hopefully that'll happen at some point, because this angle with EC3 has turned Spud into a fun breakout character. He's really taken what they gave him, made the most of it, and it's worked. And I think Spud and the fans deserve a nice payoff for that. The Rockstar Spud has left the building. Rebel comes out for a match with Angelina, then Havoc shows up and chokeslams her. Why? I don't know. There didn't seem to be any reason for this whatsoever, other than them just wanting Havoc to be in the ring so Gale could show up and fight her. 
Really? You couldn't come up with anything more creative than that? Havoc just does this because... Because she wants to exercise her choke slamming hand? That's pretty weak. Then the Gale thing. I'm sorry, they brought her back way too soon. They say she's out indefinitely with an injury, there's no timetable for her return, and then she's back a few weeks later. They just John Cena Gail Kim. She wasn't gone long enough for her absence to mean much. She should have been out a lot longer. Give Havoc some time to get some real momentum going, let her steamroll over like half the knockout roster, build her up like a juggernaut, then bring Gail back and it'll mean something. But they didn't bother with any of that. Instead, Havoc had a two-competitive match with Velvet at Bound for Glory, a two-competitive match with Madison on Impact, and that's it, really. If anything, she'd lost the momentum she had after beating Gale for the title. If you really didn't think the knockout division could stand more than a few weeks without Gale, then maybe it's time to add a few more new girls to the roster. You know, you've got two in the British Boot Camp semifinals right now that would be fucking perfect. That might be something you should think about. Yes! Also, we got the follow-up to Bram attacking Devon last week, and this was kind of underwhelming. I was interested in what the reason Bram had for doing this was, and then it turns out he was just trying to make a name for himself as the new big hardcore superstar by taking out a guy like Devon, which is about the biggest we didn't think about this for more than 30 seconds before we wrote it reason in the book. And I don't know what beating Devon really does to prove this. Oh, but apparently Devon is a hardcore legend all of a sudden. If you say so. I think that's kind of a stretch, personally. One half of a hardcore legend? Maybe. Hardcore legend on his own? Maybe not. But at least he was preferable to Tommy Dreamer, who seems to be TNA's regular fallback guy for stuff like this now. But please explain to me why Bram can beat Abyss in consecutive Monsters Balls by himself, but then when he starts calling himself some kind of big hardcore superstar, suddenly he needs help from Magnus to beat Devon in a no-DQ match. Seems kind of backwards to me, is all I'm saying. Da -na -na -na. Oh, you were not aware of this? To me, this rude Lashley contract signing highlighted the very all-stake, no-sizzle mentality of the writers right now. The promo delivery was good here, especially rude, but he's saying stuff like, I'm gonna fight you with heart and passion and determination and no personality whatsoever because mine seems to have mysteriously disappeared. The lines were so generic and obvious you almost knew what he was gonna say before he said it. Then Angle makes himself the special referee, which you could also see coming, though he seemed to think it was a big surprise, I'm not sure why. Lashley signs the contract to the displeasure of MVP, and that's where it ends. In my opinion, this segment was kind of representative of this entire show lately. Very simple, very basic, not really bad, but not very dynamic or interesting either. Frankly, I enjoyed the premiere of British Boot Camp 2 a lot more than Impact this week. Don't get me wrong, Impact is not bad right now, but it kind of feels like watching the same season of a television show over and over and over again. It doesn't seem like it's going anywhere or doing anything really productive, and every week is just more of the same stuff. My advice, TNA? Try changing it up a little bit. Just a suggestion.